Hi everyone, it's John. I hope everyone in the United States had a wonderful Thanksgiving or whatever other holiday you celebrate. I have a book review for you today. It's, I think, my first ever book review that I've posted to this channel on a book from the Liberty Fund, which I've talked a bit about off and on for the past six or eight months. I've done quite a bit of ordering, uh, but no reviewing up until now. Uh, the book I want to talk about is uh, the first one I just decided to randomly pick up and was actually quite happy with, as you'll learn about in just a few minutes. It is by Trevor Colburn, and it's called The Lamp of Experience, Whig History and the Intellectual Origins of the American Revolution. Um, Trevor Colburn uh, is uh, no longer around, uh, died in when I say 2015, this book was published in 1965 and apparently went out of print. Uh, Liberty Fund brought it back into print in 1998. Um, so there's a bit of background about the book. Um, as far as what the book is about, it, it is trying to tell you a bit about <laughs> the... The, the ways the founders, and, and not just founders, but the, the American colonial mind was looking for reasons to assert freedoms and liberties that, that they were asserting against England and King George. So, like, like the title says, it is very much it revolves around Whig history and looking for sort of an intellectual excuse to, even though it probably didn't seem like an excuse at the time, to engage in what would eventually culminate in the American Revolution. So beginning around the year 1760, uh, colonists of all stripes, you know, the pop, from the popular reader to, you know, the, the founding fathers who had somewhat more imminent educations, were eager to lay claim to sort of an intellectual mantle, uh, a set of reasons that would justify their own frustration with the increasing intrusions on colonial freedoms by the British throne. And while it could be argued that the worst offenses were still yet to come, the infringements upon personal liberties and freedoms that the colonists had already experienced up to that point had already pushed them to start looking for ideological justifications to defend themselves against an increasingly encroaching George III. It just so happens that the books that they were reading at the time provided them with exactly what they were looking for. 18th century colonial America was very much a reading culture, and one of the most popular kinds of books that colonists read was English history. A very particular kind of history was most common, actually, and it was um, the radical Whig historians. A representative sample of some authors mostly forgotten today would be people like uh, the famed jurist Edward Koch, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I always say Coke, it's, it's not Coke, it's Cook. It's spelled like Coke, C-O-K-E, but it's uh, Sir Edward Cook. But they also include uh, people like Robert Molesworth, William Atwood, and Catherine Macaulay. M most people don't recognize the, the last three names now, but uh, hopefully some people recognize uh, Cook simply because he was a uh, you know, one of the big jurists who stood up against people like James I. Uh, in their work, in their sort of body of work that these Whig historians wrote, each of these writers emphasizes a common point, that English history after the Norman invasion, uh, that's 1066, was a slow series of intrusions that tried to usurp colonial freedoms, uh, and I, I strike the word colonial, 
was a slow series of intrusions that tried to usurp the freedoms and liberties of the Anglos, the, the Angles and the Saxons, um, the two tribes that predominated England before the uh, invasion. And that's where, of course, we get the, the hyphenated Anglo-Saxon. Whigs looked back at the Angles and the Saxons and interpreted that contemporary English society should reclaim some of those principles and some of those liberties, among them uh, things like an annual representative parliament, which the Angles and the Saxons had. It was a sort of a council of wise men that was called uh, the Wittengamot, uh, I think a, a sort of middle German word, uh, a well-behaved militia, a trial by peers, and a lodial land tenure. That is land tenure, uh, uh, the tenure of land that's not owned by someone else, but rather um, the person themselves. Uh, the contrasting school of English historiography, of course, would be the Tory school, uh, which was much more friendly to the chain of monarchs, beginning with William the Conqueror, and going down to the Stuarts and the Hanovers, and sort of denied parliamentary claims and denied the colonial claims of saying that, you know, you can't really, of course, most famously, tax us without representation, but a whole bunch of other things that basically fit under this umbrella of encroaching freedoms and liberties. After he details several popular examples of Whig history, he talks about the actual Whig historians themselves, Colburn goes on to a series of 16 case studies, each of which examines the opinions of an influential colonist. Granted, they are, they definitely lean towards the opinions of wealthy, white, planter class, aristocratic men, but um, those are the ones who tend to have papers and libraries still intact. So I guess that was <laughs> the sample that was left uh, available to him. And he looks at their libraries, their papers, their ideas, opinions, diaries, especially in the light of how these histories written in these books influence their opinions of what American liberty should look like. Uh, many of their libraries, like I said, uh, he, he looks at a lot of them from uh, people like Thomas Jefferson um, and Samuel Adams and John Adams, Ben Franklin, John Dickinson, and James Wilson. Uh, while many of these people were, like I said, born into a rather wealthy or attained a wealthy status in their own time, uh, Colburn insinuates that they were still under the sway of, of Whig history, which sort of resembles the way everyone else was. So it, it wasn't something special to their socioeconomic class, but it was really representative of the influence that a lot of people found themselves under. Colburn does go out of his way to say the reading habits of the English, <laughs> of the Founding Fathers, excuse me, the Founding Fathers didn't serve as motivation for their political actions per se, and in doing so, he carefully reins himself in from overstating the importance of his thesis. But he does allude to the Founding Fathers using some of the examples discovered in their reading to help them formulate insights about which political actions to take. Since we know that those who supported American uh, Revolution those against it and those who were indifferent were roughly equal in number. Uh, there were, according to, to what I've read previously and to some extent what I've, what I've been taught, is that revolutionaries, loyalists, and the indifferent were roughly equal in number, uh, right, right, on the, right on the verge of the revolution. It would be fascinating to read another book that took up the possible influence of maybe Tory histo historiography in, in the colonies. Um, I don't know if that influence was there, but it may have been among loyalists. It's worth noting that Colburn includes a postscript to the book 
in which he explicitly calls this sort of retrospective Whig reading of history a myth. Um, perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind, however, is that it was very much believed to be true by the people who were reading it. And if an idea is true in the minds of people who are thinking about it and reading it, then it might as well be true for them. It's important to know that it's not, but that's, uh, for them, it's <laughs> sort of not terribly relevant. Uh, Colbert never spends too much time trying to split hairs regarding which ideas about the Saxon myth, that's what he calls it, the Saxon myth, were true and which were not. But whatever the details, I think it's probably safe to assume <laughs> with some historical insight that whatever liberty looked like in pre-Norman invasion, England bears little resemblance to what the founders intended for their nascent country. I, 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 for, for some reason, 11th century England just doesn't strike me as the same kind of society that uh, the founders, all Enlightenment-educated thinkers, wanted to live under. But they idealized it, they seemed to kind of, in a way, romanticize it, and they apparently looked to it for inspiration and influence. Uh, so despite the fact that I told you 16 case studies, the book is a remarkably short 243 pages. So um, I think it's just that <laughs> Liberty Fund uses very nice paper stock. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a remarkably short book. But there you go, The Lamp of Experience, Whig History and the Intellectual Origins of the American Revolution by Trevor Colburn. I will see everyone next week. Bye.